Hello everyone, welcome to Exploring with Cindy and Dan. Don't forget to click subscribe if you want more weekly updates. We are at the Safari West, the Sonoma Serengeti, in the hills of Santa Rosa, California. We will be jumping on a safari track with an amazing guide on an African safari adventure. And then we will explore with her the lower grounds of the park on foot. Join us in this adventure. Safari West is located in the hills of Sonoma County, on a 400 acres wildlife preserve, which is home of 90 species and more than 900 animals. You will experience a two and a half hour guided safari tour of the park on an open air safari vehicle, just like in Africa. And the safari tour also has a half an hour walk and guided tour of the zoo area in the lower grounds of the park. So wear comfortable shoes. In winter times from December to February, the park offers two safari tour times at 10 a.m. and at 2 p.m. But between spring and fall, they will be offering five safari times, starting at 9 a.m. Advanced reservations are required for the safari tour. The price of the safari is between $110 and $120 per adult, and $100 to $110 for seniors over 62 and teens 13 to 17 years old, and $45 for children 4 to 12 years old. You can extend your adventure with an overnight stay in a luxurious Safari West tent with a continental breakfast included. And you can walk the park grounds while in the park where guests are allowed for a starting price of $330 per night for two adults. You can also book another luxurious cottage with a starting price of $400 per night for two people. Um, Safari West is a little bit different than most zoos you go to. We're actually a privately owned facility. We're owned by a married couple, Peter and Nancy Lang. They really make it a family atmosphere. It's part of why I enjoy working here. But again, we get to do all this amazing stuff. And they've really poured so much of their life into this place. And you'll see that as we go out on the tour. It's about a 400 acre property with 90 different species and over 900 animals. So we have a lot to see today. The tour itself is going to be about three hours in total. We're going to start with the walk. I like to start with a walk early in the morning because you might get to see some of the nocturnal animals that are still awake. This walk is going to cover the lower compound. It's about 30 minutes or so. We'll go see monkeys, cheetahs, birds, all that kind of stuff. And after the tour is done, you guys have access to the lower compound again. So if you want to walk down there and see what the animals are up to, I highly encourage you to do so. You never know, they might give you toys, they might be being fed. So different levels of activity throughout the day. Um, but once we're done with the walk, we'll come back here, we'll take a little break, and then we'll load up on one of these trucks and we'll go drive around the hills for a couple hours. than the ones we saw down the road, but they are the smallest species and that's the name they're stuck with. So in this habitat, the three warthogs that are in here, they're a little hard to spot right now. They're behind that second fence, right behind the tree with all those yellow blooms. We have a whole family of warthogs. We've got mom, dad, and their daughter, Lucy. And usually when you look at a warthog, the first thing you're gonna notice are those big old warts on their face. It's a fatty pocket, helps shield and protect their eyes because even from here you can see he's got some pretty big tusks. Tusks are teeth that grow up and out and that is their main tool for self-defense. And if you're fighting off other warthogs or lions with your face, it's nice to have something to protect your eyes and that's where the warts come into play. Everyone's gonna have those warts and tusks, males and females, but the males are gonna have larger bo both because they're more likely to be fighting other males for dominance. I don't think he's gonna come over to say hello to us. <laughs> so let's go see some animals that are a little bit closer to the fence. So in this habitat, 
we have a few different types of ants play. This beige girl right at the food dish is a female kudu antelope. And over at the trough on the right, we have a dama gazelle. These are both antelope, but they look pretty different. Antelope is kind of an umbrella term, and as long as you check the right boxes, you're part of that family. We have antelope here that are 10 pounds full grown. We have antelope that are 3,000 pounds full grown. And in order to be an antelope, they have to be part of an even bigger family, the bovine family. So they're related to buffalo, cattle, goats, and sheep. They all have to have a two-toed hook, a special four-chambered stomach, making them ruminants. This is going to break down all the plant material that they eat. And somebody's got to have horns, either male and female, or just males. As long as they check those boxes, they're an antelope. And you can learn about an animal just by the way that they look. Start with the Dama Gazelle. This white fellow over here, this is an antelope from Northern Africa. They're gonna be found in the Sahara Desert. And I can tell you that they live somewhere hot because they have that light coat color. Just like a white t-shirt, that's gonna reflect the heat and keep them a little bit cooler. And so is the fact that everybody in this family has horns, males and females. Horns are a really, really great tool. We've got a couple different uses. Uh, first one, self-defense. Pretty straightforward. If you have swords on your head, it's a better tool for keeping off predators. But these animals actually use their horns for thermoregulation. Just like the fox uses those big ears to cool down the blood, it gets closer to the surface. These horns are a bone structure with blood flow and nerves running through the inside and a keratin sheath and a lid made out of fingernail material, keeping it all protected. The blood goes up into the horn, it cools down, it comes back down into their brain and body at a cooler temperature. So super important for survival if you're living in the desert. But the kudu here, she doesn't have horns. Kudu are native to slightly forested regions in southern and eastern Africa. And living in the forest, it's a little bit cooler in temperature than the desert. You've got better places to hide from a predator. She's even got some camouflage. See those white lines? That's gonna help blend into the lines of the trees. So that'll help her hide better in the forest. But while she doesn't have horns, her boyfriend does. They still have to have them in order to be an antelope. So he uses his horns to attract the ladies. Male kudu have one of my favorite styles of horns. They're massive, big, beautiful, twisty horns. Our male we have right now is very young. So his horns just point backwards, but we can tell from the direction they're going that he's gonna have a massive set of horns someday. We got our male kudu right over here. You can see his horns and how they're growing in. Now, these structures, we call these bomas, it translates to home. Inside of the boma on the right, we have an antelope who looks a little different. This is Miss Molasses. And Molasses was our happy accident. I like to be honest about that. She is a hybrid antelope. Now, Typically, you don't want to support places that have hybrids, like a liger, a lion and a tiger. Yes, they could have a baby, but that's usually going to cause some pretty serious problems internally. So that's why I'm honest about the fact that she was not an intentional birth. But, you know, nature found a way. Her mom was a female kudu, light, dusty brown, white stripes, native to southern and eastern Africa. And her dad was a bongo, a species of antelope from western Africa. So here we have our tallest and our smallest. This big, big handsome fellow is Django. He is our bull giraffe at the moment and he's coming in around 16 feet tall. try and give you guys a kiss. What I'm gonna do to get her to back away is I'm going to spray her feet. They go, oh, that's wet. Oh. And then they're <laughs> trained to back up. Um, but Megan here is gonna teach us about some drafts. <laughs> um, so here at Safari West, we have reticulated giraffes. Uh, reticulated is really just referring to the coat pattern that they have. I'm talking about the white lines in between the brown spots. To me, they kind of look like a mosaic put together. But underneath these brown spots, I'm going to bring up something Kimberly mentioned again, and that's the thermal regulation. They have a denser uh, well, quantity of blood vessels underneath these brown spots.
staples of their diet is the acacia tree, which has pretty gnarly thorns, so that tongue can reach up past the thorns, grab the leaves, and pull it back into their mouth. And if you happen to see a giraffe's tongue, you're going to notice it's not pink like ours. It's kind of this bluish, purpley, grayish, black color because it's full of melanin, which is going to act like sunscreen, because that tongue is a tool that's outside of their mouth for almost 20 hours a day. And if we did that, our tongues would get a pretty nasty sunburn. So really good use for melanin in them. Um, these are roan antelope, R-O-A-N. This is a species of antelope from southern and eastern Africa. They're going to be found in open grasslands, right alongside their predators like lions and leopards. Well, the way that those bigger cats hunt is they jump on the back and they bite the back of the neck. Well, look at those horns. You see they curve backwards. You're going to lie down your neck. All you have to do to get them off is throw your head. over there. Their horns are only four or five inches right now. I like to say they're in their party hat stage. <laughs> I see some more over in the Bomas. Let's get closer to them. On our left, we have two red river hogs. This is a species of pig from Western Africa. They're going to be found in the jungle in the Congo, spending most of their time around riverbeds. These pigs rely on their powerful snout to use it like kind of like a shovel. To dig up the ground, find roots and tubers, anything yummy, and usually the ground is a bit softer around water. But again, you can learn a lot by the way an animal looks. We talked about red-green color blindness with the red rough lemurs. That orange is the best color to be in the jungle. It's going to help blend in from the predators. If something walks by and you freeze, it might not even see you. But these two are some of my favorites on property. And Megan's. Yeah. <laughs> That's understandable. We've got Yam, our sweet little potato. She is the best. She. <laughs> Now the grass they had went and trimmed is actually meant for the sulcata tortoises we have on property. They eat a lot of greenery, but the pigs will happily scarf some down too. Pigs are omnivores, so they can eat a variety of things, but most often they're going to be eating roots and stuff they can find underground. <laughs> oh, that was so cute. <laughs> Alrighty, let's go check out some antelope. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that? In this first boma, he's hard to see. If you have sunglasses, you may have to take it off to see him. He's in the shadows. I see him. We have Bingo the Bongo, and he is the best boy here. <laughs> Bongos are native to Western Africa. We saw Molasses, who is a bongo. Bingo is not her dad, but one of his friends. But you can really see how the combination of this reddish bongo with the light brown kudu equals Molasses. Now, bongos can be found in the Congo, in the jungle, or up in the mountains. And technically, Bingo here is a mountain bongo, but Bingo Bongo from the Congo sounds so much better. <laughs> and he's a crepuscular animal, so he's most active at dawn and dusk. He likes to hang out inside midday and throughout the night. But early morning tours, we have the ones go out at 9 o'clock, he's usually up and about. We also have, right next door, the Adax antelope. And look at those horns. See how they twist? This is another species native to the Sahara Desert. White coat is a good sign, and so is the fact that everybody has horns. As they grow into adulthood, those horns are gonna twist, which is great for thermoregulation. It's more surface area for the blood to go up, cool down, and come back down into the brain and body at a cooler temperature. And again, because they need that for survival, everyone's gonna have it. But the two that are over on the right side, sticking out a little bit more, you can see their horns are a little bit shorter. 
Those two boys are about a year old. They're about the same age as the baby of Rome that we saw, whose horns were only four or five inches. Because they need that for a different reason, they're gonna grow at different lengths or different rates. Your family can help protect you against lions, but they cannot cool you down from the weather. So they need that length right away for survival. And that is everybody in this habitat. Do we have any questions? Alrighty, can everybody see them? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Cool. Alright, so on the your left, we have some boulders with legs. These are also <laughs> known as our southern white rhinos. Um, these guys can grow to be between five and eight thousand pounds, which is just absolutely massive. Um, one really big thing that's kind of screaming at us right now is Keisha's horn there. It's kind of curved downward. Have you guys ever seen a rhino like that before? Yes. So, yes? Right now? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, rhinos, uh, they shape and uh, grind, not grind, but rub and, file, yeah, rub and file their horns to a particular shape that they like. So Isha, uh, she, I, I've heard her called a California girl, and this is just how she likes to uh, together. Mm -hmm. Looks like Otto, the youngest bear, was trying to get Dad and Gob at a play or something with him, but and Gob is said I'd rather not. <laughs> um, they, they're seen kind of roughhousing. Otto will walk up to him and he'll like back up like, Oh, you're big and tough and strong, but I'm dead. <laughs> and mom is always keeping an eye on them playing and she'll let dad know when she's done and doesn't want to watch her son get played with anymore. <laughs> um, but you can see Otto right now, he's rubbing his horn on the fence line. I'm doing exactly what he's seen mom do and she's doing the same exact thing right now. Oh, he's just so cute. He knows it too. He goes straight to his head. <laughs> yeah, he loves to just kind of put on a show. <laughs> he knows we're here for him. Mm -hmm. Got a firelet to a point because if she didn't, it'd be a giant mound on their face. It grows about seven inches a year. And that's a tool for protecting your territory, for fighting off other rhinos or fighting off a predator coming after your baby. So having it come to a point is really important and everyone styles it differently. You can see on Gava's horn is short and upright, the typical, you know, horn shape we picture with a rhino. Isha's didn't always curve down. I've worked here for, I mean, almost six years now, and when I first started, her horn was upright more. And over time, she started to file a little bit differently. Nothing wrong with that. We all style our nails different. She styles her horn differently. It's still happening. So what happens if we take away the horn? This horn is just keratin. There's no nerves, there's no blood flow inside. And recently, what these conservation groups have been doing is they find the wild rhinos, they sedate them, they clean up any wounds, they cut off the horn, and they attach a tractor. Now, this does affect the rhino's lifestyle. They have to learn how to be a rhino without this horn that they've been growing their entire life. But no horn or no life. It's the better of the two odds and it's actually starting to make a difference. These are southern white rhinos. There's about 22,000 of them left in the wild. Sounds like a lot. It's nowhere near what they used to be but hopefully their numbers are going to start going up. That's not the case for all rhinos. Their cousins, the northern white rhinos, there's two in the entire world. Two girls that are past the point that they can have babies anymore. There's a good chance they're going to go completely extinct within our lifetime, which sucks. It's not fun to sit here and talk about, but that's exactly why we need to. Because without us, without everyday people caring about saving the rhinos, we won't have any more. So cattle. It's an African breed of cattle. But unfortunately, they're down a road that this truck can't drive down. It's yeah. way too muddy over there. We have a lot of dirt and gravel roads, and then we've had a lot of recent rain. So, we saw the cows. We came, we saw, we conquered. Um, we're going to get a closer look at one of the skulls. From the we have got a bunch of zebras here. This is kind of our mommy and baby group. We've had seven baby zebras in the last year. It's hard to keep track anymore. They all start to blend together. But let's get a little closer. Here from me again. 
All right, so on the right, we have a dazzle of zebra. That's what it the zebra is called. A dazzle also refers to their stripes, and it's kind of used as a camouflage. So when you get a big group of zebra together, it's kind of hard to differentiate between one another because you have all these stripes going whichever way, and it confuses their predators. And that's a dazzle of camouflage. Dazzle of camouflage. Um, another theory for their stripes is that uh, the stripes are really uh, good at deterring flies and other biting bugs. Uh, flies and other bugs have a uh, kaleidoscope-like vision. And so this uh, messes with their depth perception, especially adding in the black and white stripe factor that they have going on. So the flies get disoriented, they can't tell where they're landing, and then they smack into the zebra and fall to the ground, and then they fly away. Um, it's just a great uh, uh, deterrent for the bugs for them, and it also uh, helps with uh, less infection and just kind of spreading around germs between them too. And then another thing, do you guys see how uh, the one laying down, or the two laying down here, they're they kind of have an awkward coat compared to the others, and that's just because they're younger. So they'll start out fuzzy and more brown, and as they grow, they'll get flatter, smoother coats and more dark black um, fur will come in also. And then I have... Now, right behind the zebras, we have eland antelope. Eland are the largest species of antelope. I talked about these a little bit earlier on the break because this was the first species of antelope we had here at Safari West. And we've got my two favorite eland in the herd. Mm -hmm. Handsome fellow on the right is our bull eland. He is not even close to being done growing, and the males can get over 3,000 pounds. They get massive. And right next door, we have Miss Star. Star's got a funny horn. Uh, yeah. She's got one that goes straight and one that spirals. That's because of a horn injury. She damaged the horn at the growth plate where it connects to the skull. Started to grow a little funny, it started to twist. It's never gonna straighten out, but look, now she's got a built-in wide opener. <laughs> and lucky for her, she doesn't have to fight off any lions. And she has a whole team of vets to make sure that she's okay after an injury like that. Also know that these are the first food dishes that get filled when the caregivers go in. So usually they'll hang out down here. Now, we're gonna talk about the animals on the left side of the truck. We saw a horn from one of these animals. These are scimitar horned oryx. This is a species from the Sahara Desert, but if you were to go look for them in the desert 30 years ago, you actually wouldn't find any at all because they went completely extinct in the wild. And that was due to human impact. It almost always is because of people. There was a lot that went into it, but at the end of the day, they went extinct because of us. We have these ones here. Can't we just let them go? They live around the trees. This is the wild, right? It's not. I mean, yes, there's trees, but look, they have a house and water, and they get room service three times a day. They've never seen a predator before. If we just said, okay, here's the desert, good luck, they wouldn't make it for very long. But there was a group that did. In the 90s, the Sahara Conservation Fund and the Zoological Society of London did a breeding project where they brought about 20 of these animals from zoos to Northern Africa. And at first, the caregivers were there for their every need. But over time, the animals showed that they still had those instincts. They could find their own food or shelter or water. And over time, once they realized they've got this down, they released them. And those 20 that were released have turned into 450. They wow. brought them back from extinction, which is so cool. That's something that doesn't happen very often. And because of this, because their numbers have gone up so much, they've been moved on the list. Have you, has anyone heard of the, the red list? The list that keeps track of how many animals are in the wild and determines whether they're extinct, endangered, non-threatened. That big list, the end of it is extinct. And then there's extinct in the wild. And then there's near threat, or and then there's uh, critically endangered. And they've been moved from extinct in the wild to critically endangered. It doesn't okay, sound okay, like a whole okay, lot, okay, but it is so okay. important. It is so cool that they've been able to do this. And one of my favorite things about this species is the horns. Because if you look at them just right from the side, the two horns line up almost perfectly and it looks like one. And that's what's caused this animal to be one of the ones the story of the unicorn is based off of. Oh. And if you look at them just right, it really does line up. So they saved the unicorns.
we've got for another desert dwelling species, but these animals are from the southern deserts in Africa, the Namib and the Kalahari. And they've still got these long horns for regulating their body temperature in the desert, but they don't have light colors. They even have dark black on their body, which is interesting. It kind of goes against the idea of having a light coat to stay cool, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the deserts that they live in didn't used to be deserts. They used to be full of plant life, and what still stands are the trees. Trees cast shadows, which makes that a great form of camouflage in those surroundings. It can also, also kind of make them appear different in size. If you look at their horns or on their face, they've got these black marks, which kind of acts like an extension of the horns. So from farther away, they could look bigger than they actually are. We do have another girl with a funny horn up here. She's over towards the tree that fell. Her name is Lefty. She's got one horn that goes off to the left and one that's straight, just like the others. She's our special girl, another one that suffered a horn injury, but she would still be able to survive in the wild. She still has all that length to regulate her body temperature, and she's got a pretty good back scratcher. We also have up on the hill a few more species. We have our granny zebras Ooh. up there. We have a couple younger Gemsbach laying down in the middle. Up further towards the tree, you can see a young impala, the brown antelope that was kind of playing with the branches there. We are going to get closer to all these animals, but as we... Oh yeah, this is my favorite V1 property. I think it's so pretty and we have so many different species in the shot. We even have a vulture flying up top. Now we got pretty close to some Cape Buffalo there. And that big handsome fellow that was in the road sniffing the rear end of his friend is one of our dominant males. This is Woody. And he is like a grumpy t Yeah, we're gonna head down the road here, see if we can find any other animals. But do we have any questions about any of the ones we've seen so far? They're Barbary sheep, they're mountain climbing sheep native to the mountainous regions in Morocco. And they are wonderful climbers. So well, so well that they spend most of their time down on this cliffside. Oh, they can my. scale that like it's nothing, even the little babies. And sometimes we'll find them up in the trees as well. But they do spook pretty easily, so I have a feeling as we get closer, they're all going to make their way down there. <laughs> What's the, the hair? The fringe. Yeah, that long beard. You'll see that a lot on the males. They'll have the long beard and leg fringe like they're straight out of the 70s. And that is a tool for attracting a mate. It's not the hair that they're looking for. The males will actually lean forward and pee all over that beard. And most animals have a special organ in their face. It's between the roof of their mouth and their nose. It's called the Jacobson organ and it allows them to learn a lot through their sense of smell. That's why so many animals mark their territory with pee and poop. It's gross, but just from one sniff of that poop, they can learn all about that animal. The creator was making all these animals. There's leftover odds and ends. So they have the horns of Cape Buffalo, the face of a baboon, the stripes of a zebra, and the mane and tail of a horse. And they're called the wild beast or wildebeest, or new, G-N-U, named after the sound they make. Oh, that was a terrible impression, but you get the point. And these animals are the leaders of the Great Migration. Has anyone heard of the Great Migration before? The 1200 mile journey that takes place through southern east, southern, southeastern Africa. And it's every year, all year long. And it's led by 1.5 million wildebeest. Now, when animals are migrating, it's because they're looking for something. Better weather, more food, more water, and they have to find enough food and water to sustain 1.5 million mouths. And if they're all migrating, they're going somewhere, they've got to be onto something. That many animals going somewhere, you're going to follow. 
So other animals join in. Other antelope, zebras with prey follows predator, and then the cleanup crew. They're all following the wildebeest. But the reason that they're making this journey is because they have a superpower too. They've got these long faces with really sensitive nasal passages, and they can detect water from miles away. Wow. And if they can tell it's gonna rain coming from that direction, that's where they're gonna go. They're gonna follow the rain. By the time they get there, they're gonna have fresh drinking water, they're gonna have grass sprouting up, and once all that, all those resources are gone, they're gonna keep going. They're gonna follow the rain patterns. And it turns into this massive migration of millions and millions of animals. Really <laughs> Uh, now, on the side over here, we do have our three lovely ladies. We have Marilyn Monroe, Shirley Temple, and Lucille Ball. And they are the stars of the show. We're here for their entertainment. Um, female ostriches are really interesting. When they're looking for a mate, there's a few things they're looking for. Big, loud, and warm. And this truck, all of that and shiny. <laughs> so, oftentimes they come up and they flirt with the truck, um, which is always entertaining. <laughs> Um, you know, they'll come up and they, they kind of show off their feathers, they'll do a little dance, they might peck at the truck, and if they decide this is a nice truck, they'll sit down in front and submit for the truck, which is difficult because I can't move a 300 pound bird. <laughs> so it's nice that they are kind of farther away from the road. There has been times where, you know, they follow us in here and it makes that second gate really nice to have. And she'll kind of walk a circle around the truck and then as, you, as soon as you think she's going to go out the gate, she wraps around again. So... <laughs> nice that they're kind of in the distance there but ostriches are the largest flightless bird like i said they can weigh up to 300 pounds and that's a lot of bird to get off the ground they can't fly but not just because of their size it's because of their feathers i talked about earlier with the flamingos in order to fly these birds need flight feathers where all the strands are close together so they can push off against the wind to get that traction but ostriches only have down feathers they're really spread apart, those strands on the feather. It's good for keeping them warm, but they are never gonna be able to fly because of the feathers. They can, however, run up to 45 miles an hour. Um, not for very long, similar to the cheetah, but if they drop that speed down to 30, they can hold that for 30 minutes. So we are never going to be able to outrun an ostrich. And inside, the contents can be more than a dozen chicken eggs. They're very big, they can lay about 50 a year. So between our three girls, we get 100 to 150 a lot of eggs and usually what we'll do is we feed it to the other animals find protein and some taste texture and smell and usually they'll scramble it up or they hard boil it which takes an hour and a half to do so oh my god <laughs> now over here we have two trumpeter hornbills oh they're called trumpeter hornbills because they make a sound it sounds a bit like a trumpet or a cat crying or a baby crying these two aren't as talkative as the other pair we have. But if you hear a sound, you think it's a baby crying, it's a bird. <laughs> we do, we have birds that make wonderful impressions. We have a bird who will convince you there's elephants here. There is not, but Stella does a really good impression of one. Now let's look at these hornbills, look at their beak. You see this tall top portion? This is actually called a cask and it's hollow inside. And that cask is used to project their voice. But we can do that too. When we cup our hands together, it makes you a little louder. Same idea. It's going to be projecting our call and projecting theirs. Well, like I said, lots of different sounds to hear. Um, we're going to come back over this way. This big brown guy right here is a male Argus present. An Argus is a Greek mythological character with a hundred eyes, and when he spreads out his feathers, it looks like a bunch of eyes. Similar to a peacock, more neutral in color. He's trying to wow his lady friend, but he's also joining in in the name of singing, so come on down here. Oh, as soon as they came over, they stopped. <laughs> I was trying to get us closer to where we could hear them, but I'm sure they'll start again. Now, we just walked by a few different animals. Which one do we want to talk about first? The fox? Sure. That's one of my favorites. Now, these two cats here, these are called caracals. Caracals are a smaller African jumping cat. And if you look at the body structure, those back legs are taller than their front legs, which allows them to jump 8 to 10 feet straight up in the air. Oh. They are wonderful jumpers and wonderful hunters. Being able to jump like that, they can jump up and catch a bird mid-flight. But if they're working together, they can take down prey three times their size. So a small antelope or an unruly guest walks by, they can take down that animal for dinner. 
I do see a couple more cats on the back side of their fence. Let's put it down. We also have a baby monkey up behind you guys. What? Up to the left there. She's not really a baby anymore. She's in her terrible twos. <laughs> um, let's talk about cheetahs. Cheetahs are the fastest land animal. Does anyone know how fast a cheetah can run? Ding, ding, ding. That is perfect. That's exactly what their average or their top speed is. They can go 65 to 70 miles an hour. That's freeway speed. That's incredible. But they can only do it for about 30 seconds. Think of it as a boost in a video game. I think the coolest part of their speed is how fast they can get there. They can go from 0 to 60 in 3 seconds. But like I said, they can only hold that speed for so long, so they have to reserve that. Look at the mouse if he walks. He's very lean. They're aerodynamic. He's got long legs. The claws on the end of their paws always stick out. They're semi-retractable. Think of the way a dog's claws stick out. And that's going to act like soccer feet to get some better traction when they're running. Ooh, I actually don't know. There's not a lot of um, fat on the bones. So for zoos, the closest thing we can find, because we're not going to go feeding them all the antelope, the closest thing that zoos can find in relation to that, Mimble is munching on some acacia right now. Uh, I think an acacia tree came down because all of the animals have been eating lots of acacia the last few days, and you can tell it's very tasty. <laughs> now, potus monkeys are another one from sub-Saharan Africa. Same general area you're going to find cheetahs in. And they are the fastest running primate. They can run over 30 miles an hour, 35 miles an hour, which is pretty impressive. I mean, fastest human ever recorded could go 27, but the average person can go about 10 miles an hour. So pretty impressive speed for these little monkeys. And where they live, there's not a whole lot of trees. You can see she's a pretty skilled climber, but in the wild, they're gonna be spending most of their time down on the ground, just like us. They're terrestrial. And that means they're on the same level as the predators. So somebody in the group, typically dad or the male of the troop, his job is to be lookout. He would find a high point and do a sentry lookout position. And if he were to see something like a predator, he would alert the family and lead that animal away. We actually have two monkeys. These are Debrazas monkeys. We've got our female in the center and our male is down on the bottom left. Now these monkeys are native to Western Africa. You would find them in the Congo, in the jungle, spending most of their time up in the trees. It's the safest place to be in the jungle. If you go down to the ground, that's where your predators are. It's also where the fresh water and the juiciest fruit is found, so they have to go down to forage. And they have cheek pouches, similar to a hamster. They're gonna find as much food as they can, pop it up into their cheeks, and head back to the safety of the trees to eat. And this species has learned it is easier to survive if you're quiet. You're down on the ground, you find a bunch of really juicy fruit, and then you go, hey friends, look what I found, come check it out. You're telling everyone where you are, including all those predators. So to stay safe, they stay quiet. And instead of using their voice to communicate, they use body language and facial expressions which if she turns to us, we'll see a big orange unibrow and big white beard. And that's gonna be a marking that helps amplify those facial expressions. This is an American pintail duck, but she's special. She's actually leucistic, which is a genetic mutation, meaning she lacks most of the melanin in her body. Melanin is the dark stuff that makes our skin and our hair dark, and her body doesn't produce as much of it. So she's got white feathers and she's got blue eyes. The black swan swimming around in the water. This is Miss Morgana. Black swans are another one native to Australia, but she lives here and she is very people friendly. Usually, a group her around, she'll walk up and she'll sing to you. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes she gets stage fright, but if she's in a good mood, she may do it. Um, we let's see. Next to her. More towards the back, we have these ducks. They're brown on the body, black and white in the face. These are called white-faced whistling ducks. It's a very accurate name. They do a cutest little whistle. It sounds a lot like a rubber ducky. And the black and white bird that's approaching them right now is a sacred ibis. Oh, we hear the hammer cock. Those are the birds that are responsible for the wonderful nest building. Um, let's see, let's scoot over this way. A nest from last year in this tree. And this year's nest up at the top. Now, somebody had asked about if we can get sicknesses here. Absolutely. There's actually a really bad sickness going around with wild birds right now called the avian bird flu. And in an abundance of caution, we have closed down the aviary. 
We haven't had any cases of it here, but we want to make sure it stays that way. So we're not letting guests go inside the aviary right now. We want to keep all the outside germs out, but we get to walk around the edge and we still get to see them pretty close. These gray birds, we have one sleeping. They tuck their head into their feathers, kind of like wearing an eye mask to bed. And then one Oh yeah, it's real comfortable. <laughs> Uh, and call the confusion <laughs> and you'll see more as they approach. They start to chase each other. And as we get closer, you'll see it looks like they have a little helmet on their head. So that's why they've been named the helmeted guinea fowl. Here we have two different types of flamingos. The really bright, vibrant, um, colorful ones, the really bright pink ones. These are the American or Caribbean flamingos. You can find them in Florida, down along the coast of South America. And then the ones that are really light, they're almost white in color, are the African greater flamingo. They're actually the largest species of flamingo. Does anyone know how a flamingo gets their color? What do you think? Because they eat shrimp. But more importantly, it's from what the shrimp are eating. The shrimp and these birds eat algae. The slimy green color that grows underwater. And while it's green when we look at it, it's actually full of something called beta carotene, which is the same thing that makes carrots orange. And when they process that beta carotene in their food, it goes in their feathers, turning them pink. And then we do something pretty similar. If you eat a bunch of carrots, you start to turn a little orange and smell those things because that's how we process it. And it's really bright, vibrant birds close to us. These are the scarlet ibis. They are going to get their pink coloring the same way the flamingos do. And the ibis have this long, thin, curved beak. It's used to pierce into wet sand or mud around beaches and rivers, get down to all the goodies down there. We got another pink bird. Sitting on the other side of these branches, we have a few roseate spoonbills. And if you look at their beak, it's flat and spoon-shaped on the end. And they use that to sift around the water, see if they can find any goodies. Ooh. Do you guys see the bird at the base of the tree? He's brown, they're brown with a little bit of pink feathering coming out. That's a young scarlet ibis. The pink birds are gonna get their coloring over time through their food. So when they're young, they're usually dark, they're gray, they're brown, they're white. And then over time, with the more beta carotene they get in their food, the more pink feathers are gonna appear. So it's pretty cool we got to see a young one. Story. Um, Further back towards the rock, right into this palm tree, we have a few more storks. Storks are known for having that really sharp, pointy beak. These are called white-bellied storks. It's a stork with a white belly, so it's a pretty accurate name. Oh, and we have our third species of ibis in here. So, right in the middle. If you did your safari tour at 10, you can have a nice lunch after your safari tour at the Savannah Cafe. And remember that reservations are also required. This is the end of our video. Thank you so much for watching this video and please consider subscribing to our channel with the notification bell on so you'll know when we'll have new and amazing videos. We will really appreciate it. Thank you.